I almost fear to break the atmosphere. I, I'm, I'm sure that you felt and enjoyed the music that was played this morning. They, uh, we have truly been blessed as a church to have people so talented and so filled with God's spirit that uh, their music just rings with the joy of God. And I appreciate it. I think, thank you very much. And I happen to know they've worked hard at this too, though. This didn't happen overnight. They, even though they're, they're talented, they literally practice, and uh, they've had this planned ahead of time. And our singers, I, I tell you, it's a joy to worship here. And uh, the talented people make it even more of a blessing. If you've noticed the theme, it was on grace. I think that would be hard to miss, wouldn't it? Grace, marvelous, wonderful, unbelievable, and undeserved grace. But maybe we may have the wrong opinion of grace. We may have the wrong ideas on grace. Heaven knows there's plenty of discussion going around in the religious world about different things. And Adventists don't always see things the way the rest of the Christian world does. And we're going to maybe look at a few things this morning. But first, we're going to go to heaven, at least mentally. But before we do that, I'd like to pray and ask God's Holy Spirit and blessing on this sanctuary and on you and on myself. And as I do that, I would love for you to pray your own prayer and ask God to give you a message within this message so that God speaks to you personally. So if you would like that to happen, then as I pray, just simply give a little quick prayer to God and say, God, speak to me today. Shall we bow our heads? Holy God in heaven, I don't know what it would take to feel worthy, to stand before your people and speak to them about the majesty and wonders of you, our holy and magnificent God. I feel extremely unworthy, but I ask you, Lord, since you have chosen me to bless me, to help me to be bold, to present this message with the power from heaven, not from my own will or force, but direct my thoughts, my speech. Lord, I believe you've helped me assemble this sermon, but still there's always something that happens. Someone may need a special word. So please direct my thoughts. Cleanse the sanctuary of any evil that Satan or we ourselves may have brought in here, God. Let us feel your holiness. Let us feel your might and your power, your glory. Let us know that we have been in your presence. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Grant each individual that hears this, this topic this morning. Grant them the Holy Spirit, not only to grasp and understand, but be willing to apply to their lives. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our sacrifice, and our High Priest, we give you praise. Amen. As I said, we're going to go to heaven, at least mentally. And I was told this, this morning to remind everyone that maybe you haven't done so. You might want to turn off your cell phones and devices, unless, of course, you're expecting something from an emergency. Uh, but I know often, I, if I even bring mine, sometimes I'll forget to turn it off. And just as sure as the world, somebody will call, even if it's some commercial wanting to sell me something. 
So you might want to check that. But let's go into heaven. There is an assembly going on in heaven. A decision is being made. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are about to endeavor on a whole new plan. They're going to make another creation, different from the others. This one is going to be even special. And so the three of them decide what they're going to do, and they've decided that planet Earth is now going to exist. And oh, what a planet. They planned all the lush greenery, the shrubbery, the massive trees, unlike anything we know today. And the earth was covered with rolling hills and was made adaptable for living creatures. And then, of course, God decided to fill the atmosphere with those creatures and the oceans and the rivers with those creatures and the land. And then, of course, they decided that they would do something more different than they've ever done before. And they planned on mankind. And oh, what a creature mankind was to be. So majestic, so noble. And he was going to be like God. He was not going to know evil. His mind was going to be pure and noble. So he created man, and he created him quite majestic. And of course, they decided that Jesus would be the one doing the creating. And he made man in his image, pure, noble, and 14 feet tall. And then he gave him a wife that was perfect in symmetry. I know today women and commercialism and women have to have the perfect shape and, and, uh, and perfect hair and well Eve was just that. Perfect. But she wasn't 14 foot tall. When she was brought to Adam she fit right under his arm so that when he put his arm around her, she would feel completely secured. And so he made them this way. But then he did something even more special to make mankind like God. He gave them the ability to create life. I should say procreate life. So, they decided that once they did this, what if sin and disobedience should erupt upon the earth? And so they made a three-phase plan of salvation. And the first of that three-phase plan was sacrifices. And all of us know that in the Garden of Eden, that plan was put into place after they had sinned. God took animals, sacrificed them, and made clothing for Adam and Eve. And we know that when their sons came along, that the sacrificial system was in place because one decided to bring his own kind of sacrifice, and the other brought the sacrifice of the animal. Now, why did God choose that type of plan? Well, think about it. Everything was innocent. Everything was pure, except man had chosen to disobey and doubt his God. So they had to take an innocent creature 
a perfectly pure animal that had done no wrong, that had no part in sin, but they were to take this animal and to kill it and watch its life bleed out as a sacrifice for their wrongdoing. Now, if you're not accustomed to death, imagine, imagine the horror that this must have brought upon the person sacrificing this animal. And that's what it was meant to be. It wasn't supposed to be something that was a joy. It wasn't supposed to be something that was pleasant. It wasn't even supposed to be a relief from sin. It was supposed to make sin look as ugly and miserable and as hateful as it really is. And so they brought the sacrificial system in for that purpose, pointing to the real sacrifice that was to come. And then secondly, God decided as man multiplied that he would choose from mankind a race of people, a group of people I should say, and make them a representative of what heaven should be like, of what righteous people should be that are connected with God. And he made these people so that they could be an example to the entire human race that if they would serve and honor God, that they would be blessed among everyone, that God would bless them, there wouldn't be any sicknesses, there wouldn't be any diseases, there wouldn't be any death or heartache, these people would just be blessed so beyond their imagination that the world would wander after their God. And then, of course, the third phase was the real sacrifice to come. The Messiah was promised that he would come and redeem his people. Well, sin did spread, did it not? Like a dark cloud hovering and floating across the earth, sin became the plague of mankind, and death, death became common. Would you turn with me to Romans chapter 5? Romans chapter 5 of your New Testament. And we're going to look at one verse, verse 12. Most of you know this anyway, but Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says, because sin had entered, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all had sinned. Sin and death became the plague of the human race. Now the people that God had chosen to be his representatives of heaven, to be a people that had his character and received his blessing, well, we know the story. They failed also. Rather than being the representative, they got it into their mind that they were so special that the rest of the people on earth were just plain filth and didn't matter. They had a savior, but the rest of the world didn't. And then what about the sacrifice? The system of sacrifices. It was supposed to rend the heart when someone sinned and had to slay that innocent animal. 
but it became, they became so callous that at that animal became their excuse for sin. They could sin and just kill the animal and everything would be okay. So they were losing their dread of sin and their dread of slaying the innocent for their guilt. And so what kind of example was this to the world? All they saw was people that lived just like them. The only difference was they kept slaying all these animals for, to make them feel better. When they first started, the Bible says that God first smelled the, the sacrifice and it was sweet to his nostrils because they were doing it with their heart in agony of the sin they had committed. But after it became routine and they didn't care if they sinned, they just used the animal as an escape, then God finally got to the point, he said, would you please stop? I can't stand your sacrifices. They're a stench in my nostrils. They mean nothing to you. And they were supposed to represent the death of their own creator. But sin took its toll. The people failed. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, you might want to put your finger there in, in Romans because we'll go back there. But Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to start at verse 33. Matthew 21, verse 33, this is a parable that Jesus put out. said, hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and put a hedge about it and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits from the vineyard. And the husbandmen took the servants, they beat one, killed another, and stoned the other. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise as they had done the first. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, Man, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard, and they slew him. And when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen, he asked. And they said unto them, or he will miserably destroy these wicked men and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in due season. Now we're not done reading yet, but I want you to digest what just was said there. The first group of individuals that said God would have to deal harshly with. But he wasn't done with that vineyard. He would let it out to another group. So I want you to digest that. And Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone and be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind to powder. 
And when the chief priests and Pharisees saw and heard this parable, they perceived he spoke of them. What I want you to understand there is that Israel failed. They failed miserably. They wanted to be like the world. They still wanted salvation. Oh, they wanted to be the chosen ones. In fact, when they were crucifying Christ, they had got into this habit of obeying to the point where while Jesus was on the cross, the Sabbath was coming on. These men had to run home and get all cleaned up and prepped so that they would not defile the Sabbath. And their hearts were full of blackness and murder. So they were being religious, but they were not even close to doing the will of God. That's something for us to think of. Psalms 51.5, speaking of the condition of man and how sin had overrun it, it's, David even says, you know, I'm shaped in iniquity and I am conceived in sin. So from birth, we are in trouble. From birth, we need help. The chosen people failed to obey. Sacrifices lost their meaning. In John 3.16, though, was God angry at mankind? It said, for God so loved the world that he actually sent his own son, Jesus, to be the sacrifice that we, whoever would believe, might obtain eternal life. He didn't send Jesus to appease him, to be an intercessor and say, Father, please don't hurt the people anymore. He sent Jesus because it said what? He loved us. He loved us enough to sacrifice his son, to allow his son to be born as a human, neglecting and giving up his heavenly powers to be led and directed and obey God through the promptings of the Holy Spirit for our sakes, for our sakes. Ephesians 2, verses... Uh, 8 and 9, tells us that we, we are saved by the grace of God. Saved by grace through faith, not of our good works, unless any man should boast. Now that's, that's interesting because I want to tell you that the Christian world take this verse and they distort it and preachers all over the world and I'm going to put it in this language too many preachers in the Christian churches are nothing more than false prophets determined to mislead the scripture not only on the Sabbath but on grace and on works and on the state of the dead, they are determined to make certain that these truths are hidden from reality so that their sermons that they've preached over the years can continue as a belief. So what about grace? What do they teach about grace? Well, it says that we're under grace. So if we're not under grace, we're not under law, so we don't have to keep any of the law. We can just be under grace, and what is it? There are two definitions of grace in the Bible, and most of you know the one, unmerited favor. In other words, you got something you didn't deserve. We got something we didn't deserve, and that's true. But that's not the ending of grace. 
The other definition in the Bible of grace is God says, I will give them grace that they, you and I, might know me. Now, I hope you understand the depth of that verse. God is saying, I'm going to be so gracious to man through the Holy Spirit that they will be so acquainted with me that they will know me. Now, this is important. Not know about me, but have a personal working relationship with me. Now, that's grace. I am telling you, that is grace. And it's also unmerited favor. What have we done to deserve to know God that closely? In fact, probably everything we've done is the exact opposite of that. So yes, grace is important, but I think we misunderstand the purpose of grace. It's not to excuse us to sin. It's supposed to help us get a relationship with God that we're so willing to sacrifice our lives that the Holy Spirit can transform, recreate us, renew us, restore us, give us a new birth, change us completely. Not allow us to stay everyday sinners, sacrificing Jesus every day. The preachers will tell you that once you've accepted Jesus and you're under grace, you're saved for the rest of your entire existence, and nothing can change that, not even if you live like the devil. Well, what an insult to God. What a slap in his face. What a degradation of the sacrifice of Jesus. That's no better than the Israelites sacrificing the animal without caring. How many of us are sacrificing Jesus over and over, and it doesn't do anything here to us? Because he's an escape for our sin so that we can get to heaven. How selfish. How utterly selfish of us. What about works? They tell you that if you do any kind of works, then you're, you're embarrassing Christ by negating his sacrifice and his grace. So if you're trying to do works, then you're interfering with grace. And if you do grace, you don't need to do any works. So no wonder the Christian world is in a mess in their mind with this. And by the way, let me remind you that good Christian works aren't necessarily the works that God created us to do. Going to church visiting people in the hospital, feeding the poor, you, you name it. They're not necessarily works inspired by the Holy Spirit. Remember the parable that Jesus gave when he came and he separated the sinners and, and the righteous? And some of the people ended up over with the sinners, they called them the goats, and they couldn't figure out why they were there. And they said, Lord, what are you doing? You've made a mistake. Haven't we done all of these wonderful works in your name? We've healed the sick. We've cast out demons. We've done marvelous things in your name. And what did he tell them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. In other words, what did they do? They adopted a form of religion, they went to church, they did good works, they claimed the grace of Jesus, but they were still lost because they were not a part of him. Wow. 
That makes the responsibility of preaching grace and obedience an entirely different kind of responsibility, my friends. Should we obey? Should we do works? If we do good works, are we negating grace? If we claim grace, then does that mean we're not supposed to do good works? What does obedience and, and grace have in common? Ephesians 2 verse 10, right after it spoke of grace, it gave you this statement, you are, and it's speaking of all of us, we are his workmanship created in Christ, unto good works. In other words, when we accept Christ, we are supposed to begin to yield. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're going to notice something there. Romans 6, look at the first two verses. Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Look at verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now look at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should even obey it in your lusts. Wow. God is trying to tell us two things here. First of all, he's giving us grace that we might know him and become like him. And as we become like him, remember that vineyard that was going to be let out to other people? My dear Israel, you, if you are Christ, the Bible says that you are Abraham's seed and indeed Israel, grafted into Abraham. You are the new husbandman that God has led his vineyard out to. We are supposed to be those blessed, those example type of people. We are supposed to reflect the image of God, not only in our good works, but in our dependence upon his grace. Jeremiah 13, verse 23, talks about us in doing good, it says, can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard in spots, even if he wants to? Then can you, who are accustomed to do evil, then can you turn around and start doing good? Well, the Ministry of Healing, page 348, says, Christ's grace alone can enable us to resist and subdue our sinful natures. Now you hear what that's saying? Resist and subdue? That means that you and I have to accept that desire that the Holy Spirit gives us to be different. And knowing that we can't accomplish it, then what are we going to do? We start pleading with our God who created us in Jesus to do good works. Desire of Ages, page 523. Christ accepts nothing short of obedience to his will. Desire of Ages, 816. In following Jesus, obedience is a requirement. Ministry of Healing, 99, through Christ's grace, we can possess the same character as Jesus. 
I'm trying to lay a heavy burden. Philippians 2, verse 13, it is God which works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So do you see our works then become our yielding to the Holy Spirit and our dying daily and saying, God, I can't do this. My nature won't allow it. I need a new nature. Why do you think Jesus said we had to be born again? And Jesus moves in and begins to work in our mind to will and to do. Now, if we leave that alone, Jesus will turn us into an exact image of himself. But if we decide to interfere, if we decide, I don't want to obey, I'll obey you this far, God, but, you know, leave this other thing alone, I'll work on that. <laughs> and the Bible's already told us we're helpless. We're helpless. Through Christ's grace, we, we can possess. Philippians 2.13, it is God which works in, us, in you, giving you both the desire and the ability to obey and to do his pleasure. First Selected Messages 364, he that tries to reach heaven by attempting to do good and keep the law is attempting the impossible. Man cannot be saved without obedience, but this obedience must be surrendering ourselves to God so that he can develop a godlike character within us. In other words, we just have to want it. But most of us don't want it. Jesus spoke plainly when he said, men, including us, Christians, men love darkness better than light because the light is always pointing out our defects. But friends, rather than hide from those, we should say, Lord, I see it. I hate it. Change me. Take it out of me. And what's the promise? I will renew you. I will restore you. I will regenerate you. We do God such an injustice by playing Christian. Why do you think the Bible says, oh, you are lukewarm, I can't stand you. You're going to end up like the old Israel. I'm going to have to just dismiss you. How is it that we as Adventists live like the world? That's what Israel did. Why do we live with so much sin? Oh, we're saints when we come through the church door. We're all here on Sabbath. So were the people that sacrificed Christ. That was Sabbath keepers, you know. So it is God that works in us. I want to read one more thing, and then we'll, we'll close this. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to read 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. What does God want Christians to be? Does he want Christians to be weak and helpless and unable to overcome sin and living like the world so that when we tell the world they need to be in church with us, and they look at us and say, huh, what do I want to come there for? You guys are not in one iota better than I am. And most of them are telling the truth because we are denying Jesus 
by our sinful characters and sacrificing Christ over and over and over rather than let him change our character. Many of us say we'll obey God no matter what he asks. And you know what? Even in our very church, God sent us a message that the last day Christians, due to health reasons, should avoid flesh eating. But all I hear throughout most of our people is, well, Jesus ate meat. Jesus did this. Uh, if I eat the clean, I'm okay. And we all eat blood if we eat the meat from the grocery stores. I know most of you that go out to buy that clean steak. You don't go look for the brown one. You look for the red, juicy one, the one full of blood. And Jesus flat out made it clear in the scripture, the only use for the shedding of blood was for atonement. No blood should be consumed. No fat should be consumed because it was an abomination to him. But we do it. And we say we'll do anything God asks us to do. Well, we can't even change our diet for him. So how much are we obeying God? Martin Luther King. Many of you remember his sermon, his topic, I have a dream. I have a dream that one day my children can live in a country where all children can mingle together and play and not worry and fear. And to a partial extent, that's pretty much accomplished. I have a dream, dear church members. I have a dream, a dream of the Adventist church, a dream of the church putting away our picky Eunice living for Jesus, our surrendering ourselves to Christ, being that shining example that we are called to be, an example to the world. As we read, I didn't even read it, did I? Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hasn't any flavor, then what good are we? We are the light of the world. And if a city has a light and it puts it on a hill, it's to shine. You and I are the light of the world. What kind of light are we? Are we hiding it under a bushel so that the wicked only see our wickedness and not the light? Jesus said you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine that people will see it and glorify you. You're not looking, are you? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. My friends, obedience and grace are locked hand in hand. But Forcing obedience is not it. Obedience by yielding to the Holy Spirit of God to change us and make us like him. Then we can truly begin to say we are God's people. We are Christians. Not just Christians, christ -ians. Let us all commit our lives. Let us lose our lives and put it in the hand of God where he can really save us and use us and this work can be done and we can all glorify together in the kingdom. Thank you. Please join us in singing our closing hymn.
491, hymn number, I'm sorry, hymn number 492. And in honor of time, we're going to sing the first and fourth stanza. Hymn number 492, please stand. Blessed Lord and Holy God, please help us to be like you. Help us to just turn ourselves over, to quit resisting, to quit controlling parts of our lives and let you change our character and make us that shining light that the world needs to see. Make us bold, make us righteous, make us pure, make us holy. For we love you, God, and we appreciate all you've done with your grace and your mercy. In Christ's name, we give you praise, and I pray that with our lives, we will honor you. Amen. So anybody that all the little kids would like to come down, maybe you could get out a dollar or hold some money up and they'll collect it. And that'll go towards our worthy student fund at TAA. And here comes Mr. Johnny with the school right now. Mr. Johnny, you've been working out. You can 